1973, I was a postdoc uh, in molecular biology at Columbia University. And it, it was a time really of, a, of a, a lot of intense discussion. I had a lot of friends who were postdocs. Subjects came up naturally. And um, I just happened to come across um, a copy of the Wistar Symposium that was held in 1966 in Philadelphia. It's a collection of essays about Darwinian uh, theory. Uh, and I read Murray Eden's article, a critical art article about Darwinian theory, and uh, Marcel Schutzenberger's critical argument about uh, Darwinian theory. And I started talking about it with um, the other postdoctoral fellows, people who were working in the laboratory at the time. And I discovered, somewhat to my own um, surprise, that the, the arguments, which seemed so very credible, very important, uh, went virtually unanswered uh, among the biologists that I knew, uh, who tended to dismiss the arguments in a way that suggested that they hadn't really understood them, and if they had understood them, were not prepared to respond to them. And that was, that was the beginning of uh, my skepticism about Darwinian theory. When I spent a year in Paris uh, working with Schutzenberger, of course, both of us enriched each other's opinions. Uh, Schutzenberger had been a long-standing critic within the French biological establishment of Darwinian theory. And what he had to say um, reinforced what I had to say, what I had to say reinforced what he had to say. Later, I talked with Murray Eden. There were, were a group of us who were similarly skeptical. I must say in the 70s, in the late uh, 60s and in the 70s, there was a much more intensive um, uh, degree of opposition to Darwinian theory, a much, a much greater willingness to um, examine Darwinian orthodoxies. Uh, the great counter-reformation took place in the 1980s and the 1990s. So when I started work, or when I started thinking about these issues, uh, Schutzenberger and I wanted to write a book together on this. Um, there, was a, there was a very relatively liberal um, attitude among mathematicians, people who were interested, uh, physicists, uh, people who were interested in Darwinian theory, a much greater willingness to, to wonder whether any of this could possibly be true. So that was roughly my own background, my own approach to it. Well, the claim that all skeptics about Darwinian uh, orthodoxy or Christian fundamentalist stands refuted by me. It's obviously not true. I'm not, neither Christian nor a fundamentalist. Um, but lots and lots of people are skeptical in the scientific community. Uh, I know dozens of mathematicians who scratch their head and say, you guys think this is the way life originated. It's absolutely a preposterous theory. And many, many very significant figures. John von Neumann, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, just laughed at Darwinian theory. He hooted at it. Uh, so it's, it's perfectly absurd. This is a point in a polemical dispute. It's not a, a reasonable um, standard of criticism. Opposition to Darwinian theory is, I wouldn't say widespread, but there's a consistent group of people among mathematicians, among physicists, among some um, very good speculative biologists who simply don't, uh, don't accept it, don't, e don't even regard it as a scientific theory in any reasonable sense. Talking about what the word evolution means, let's, let's go from the, the um, least controversial to the most controversial. Least controversial is that life seems to be related in some fundamental way. Everything that lives seems to share at the bottom, au fond, a common, a common pattern. Um, I don't think that's controversial. I think life is magnificently related. Uh, I think everything that, that lives does share a common pattern. Second slightly more controversial claim. That pattern is one of descent, common descent. That is to say, what we see in the, in the fossil record, what we can imaginatively reconstruct, what we can interpret, uh, is a pattern where uh, the su successive layers of organisms all derive from organisms that have gone before, that's obvious, but they've derived in an ever-narrowing, a tapered cone. That's not an issue that I want to address or, or not address. I don't have very strong feelings. If someone says, yeah, common descent is just a rock solid fact, I'm prepared to accept it. I don't have a strongly um, held uh, position on that. The third, the, uh, the, the most controversial uh, level, occurs when one says, I have a theory to explain the observational pattern. I know how it occurred. And that theory is not common descent, not common pattern, but a specific mechanism an engine capable of reproducing the effects we see around us. Common descent is involved because the engine, in part, assumes hereditary transmission of information. 
but it's not just common descent, it's hereditary transmission of information with random accidents and with natural selection. That mechanism, and this is the controversial claim, is adequate to account for the manifest and observed complexity of living creatures. I say it's controversial because I think it's false. Not only do I think it's false, I think it's overwhelmingly false. On that level, when one actually has a theoretical proposal to make, however innocently expressed, however far from the standards of theoretical proposals one finds in physics, at that level there's a genuine controversy. There are issues to be determined, and they cannot be determined by uh, injunction, by fiat, by declaration. They have to be determined by a very serious, careful, sober investigation of the evidence and the theory. There's no, there's no evading that. And that hasn't been done since Darwin wrote in 1859. There have always been critics, they haven't been heard. There's always been a countercurrent of disgruntlement and dissatisfaction that's never been adequately voiced. It's about time that's done. Nothing will happen, nothing bad will happen. The question is, why among physicists? <laughs> We're back live, so if you want to call us, you can. If you have any thoughts relating to what you heard Dr. Belinsky say, or anything relating to spirituality, philosophical stuff. Brandon, while we're waiting for a call, if there's another call or two, what would you like to share? Well, I think he brought up some, some good points as far as the mechanism and the inadequacy of, of uh, well, right now genetic mutation is supposed to be the mechanism, what provides the raw materials for evolution to happen. Darwin thought it was heredity, simply these changes that happen from generation to generation children are a bit different from their parents due to a different genetic combination and Darwin thought that these changes generation to generation would be sufficient to produce evolution all the different kinds of life all the variation and such and of course the work of Gregor Mendel essentially proved that wrong there is variation but it's within limits there's boundaries to genetic variation so now the big idea is mutation and the problem with mutation as we're finding more and more in recent decades that mutation is insufficient as well it's it's a completely random uh, mechanism, you know, if you were to take some incredibly complex system like a, a computer or a space shuttle or uh, a, a car or anything like that and just randomly put some parts in it, you know, see if it, see if it helps. The overwhelming odds say that n not only will it not help, you're, you're probably going to destroy the system. And that's, that's really what we're finding with, with, we know of a lot of genetic mutations, a lot of them. Uh, and the, the, the overwhelming majority of them are either uh, somewhat harmful, so many of them are fatal, some of them don't seem to have much of an effect at all, but we are not finding mutations that, that improve life, that improve creatures. Thank you.